So hi everyone and welcome to our webinar on what to include on the accessibility help page on your website. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Mark Gaddis. I'm the digital marketing manager here at AbilityNet. Um, and also on this call we have Adi Latif, um, an accessibility and usability consultant here at AbilityNet and also Catherine Talbot, an accessibility and usability consultant also. Um, so thank you for joining us. Uh, next slide, Catherine, if you don't mind. So yes, uh, thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, just to remind ourselves what this webinar is about, we're going to look at what digital accessibility is, um, the importance of good digital accessibility practices. We're going to offer some of our top tips. We're going to identify, look at how you can identify what is accessible on your website, why you need an accessibility help page, and what to include on the page. Um, so that's what we hope to kind of cover on this webinar today. It looks to be at the most an hour, and that will include a Q&A session. Um, we are offering, offering live captions during the webinar, um, so that's the text you can see scrolling at the bottom of the screen. Our thanks to Judith from My Clear Text for that. Um, and just a few pieces of housekeeping from myself. So slides, a transcript, and a recording of the webinar will be made available post-event. Um, you should, depending on how you're joining the webinar, see a few features that you can engage with us through. So there is a Q&A window. So if you want to ask um, our experts on the call a question, um, please make sure you're using the Q&A window. That's as opposed, as opposed to the chat window, um, which we encourage you to have more general conversations. Um, so perhaps you want to comment on something that Addy or Catherine have said, um, use that window, but use the Q&A uh, window if you have a particular question you want us to answer. Um, that way we can just make sure we get um, around to answering you. And then just to note at this stage, there will be a feedback form to ask any follow-up questions post-webinar. So if we don't get around to responding to you, um, if you perhaps have a comment that we, uh, we should be aware of, please do use that as an opportunity to give us some feedback. That's great. So I'm just gonna do a one slider very quickly um, because we want to go on to the, the, the interesting content, I'm sure. So I do just wanna give an introduction to AbilityNet for anyone that hasn't um, been on one of our webinars previously, or perhaps you're not as familiar with us and the range of services we offer. Um, but basically we're a technology charity. We provide a range of free and paid for services and resources. Um, our goal, our kind of mission is to remove barriers to inclusion in the digital world. Um, so we want to make sure people of all abilities um, can achieve their goals in, in a digital space. Um, to that end, we offer a variety of services, so I'm only going to touch on some of them here. Um, but we offer IT support at home through home visits and remote support. We have our free phone helpline, which is 0800 269 545. We have fact sheets about adapting technology to meet your needs on-demand webinars, which we're very um, pleased you're joining us on one of those. And we also have My Computer My Way, um, which is your guide to every accessibility feature on every computer, tablet, and smartphone. And Catherine is going to speak about that a bit later. And then something that's also important to highlight is we do have um, expert paid for services. So we have our digital accessibility services, which includes consultancy, design reviews, auditing, accreditation, um, user testing, training, and off-the-shelf products. Plus there's other service areas we have, including our workplace and higher education and student services. So we do a lot. Um, we, we would be considered arguably probably a small to medium charity, um, but we, we offer an awful lot. Um, so that was just a bit about us. And now what I want to do, just before we get into the main um, content of this webinar, is we want to just run a poll. Um, so this is an interactive um, opportunity for you to engage with us. Um, and as we've in many of our webinars, the first thing we want to do is just ask a bit about who's on this webinar. Um, so I've had some sight of this, but it's really good to get um, Catherine, for Catherine and Addy to have a sight of this. So we just want to tell you to tell us a bit about who you are. Um, multiple choice options, are you a website owner, manager, a content creator, an accessibility professional, an accessibility advocate, or perhaps you don't fit any of those categories. Um, depending on how you've joined the webinar, you should see a poll on screen. 
Um, so if you can um, use that to respond to us, but if you don't see anything, that's, that's probably because of how you've joined the webinar. Um, so just feel free to pop something in the, uh, the, the chat window about who you are. And then a second question is just about, um, just a question to clarify, do you currently have an accessibility help page on your website? Um, so you've joined this webinar specifically about that. Do you currently have one? Yes, no, perhaps you're not sure and you're, and you're going to your website now to check, or perhaps actually because of um, who you are, that question is not relevant to you. So I've just given you a bit of time. We've had 78% of you vote, um, and I'm now just going to share the results. Um, so for Catherine and Addie's benefit, there's actually a nice spread of um, people on this call. So the highest number is 39% at accessibility advocates. Um, so I'm assuming that's people who kind of champion accessibility um, within their organizations. But the spread is quite even. So 33% uh, so have identified as content creators, 30% um, as a website owner or manager. Um, and then we've also got a few coming through on the chat function. So UX designer, learning technologist, and so on. And then about the help page. So kind of reassuringly for us, 40% um, of you do have an accessibility help page on your website. Um, but 34% of you have said outright no, it's not something you have. 21% I'm not sure, 4% um, not really relevant to you. Um, so that's really good for us because actually um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a bit about accessibility and why it's important and the business case for. Um, but the information we have about accessibility help pages will help you to either update or create an accessibility help page. Um, so I think actually this is going to be really interesting um, for everyone on the webinar and I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand over to Addy to um, start talking about um, what digital accessibility is. Great, thank you. Thank you for, for that, Mark. Um, hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining the webinar. Um, I work as an accessibility consultant here at uh, AbilityNet. And a lot of the work I do is um, making the business case for accessibility, why it's not just uh, good to have, or it, you know, it's not just for social um, responsibility of an organization that actually makes um, some real clear business sense. Um, so what is accessibility? Uh, for people who aren't aware of digital accessibility, and which I believe most people are, but just as a brief overview, digital accessibility is designing your digital content in such a way that can be accessed by anybody, uh, including people who are disabled. Um, your content can be a website, it can be a mobile app, it could be a PDF document, a Word document, a presentation. And why is it important to be accessible? Well, um, the most important reason is it provides an opportunity for a, a disabled person to be as um, integrated into the world as possible. It allows them to be as independent as possible. So, for example, um, a person is disabled, if they, they come across a digital platform, they, an accessible platform, they, they can carry out activities such as uh, doing the shopping, um, paying their bills, uh, and uh, you know, renewing your TV license. So just anything that we really take for granted, um, it's great for everyone to be able to do that. And stuff like this wasn't possible a long time ago. Um, when I was at school, when I was younger, um, I lost my sight. Uh, as a teenager and a lot of things I wasn't able to do um, such as you know little things like for example doing an exam I'd have to have someone read out my exam for me and they would have to um, scribe for me but now all that's possible uh, when, when I come across an accessible um, online exam for example um, so it's just it's, it's a really powerful opportunity now to, to, to give independence to people when, when that wasn't um, possible in the past um so um here's some of the the reasons why um it makes um financial sense so up to um 20 of the population 
um, has uh, some form of a disability. And most disabilities are hidden, so you don't you don't get to see that. Um, the spending power of people um, who are disabled and their families and friends is about two hundred and forty nine billion pounds a year. That's just in the UK. Um, in the world, there's over one point three billion people. Um, who are disabled, and just to put that into context, that's more than the population of China and more than the population of India. So it's a massive um, market there. So in effect, if you make yourself accessible, then you've got, um, very simply, there's more revenue for your business. Um, an individual is linked um, to society in so many ways. So for example, um, at AbilityNet, you know, I, I've got a disability and um, at AbilityNet, we were bringing in a, a, a piece of software that could gauge employee um, satisfaction. And we looked at a few companies. Um, there was a company called Office Vibe. And unfortunately, the Office Vibe didn't work well with my screen reader. And they weren't very open to us um, to, to make it accessible. So we just went to a different company called Pekin. And so the whole business moved with this one employee, me, that can access um that, that piece of software and obviously we've been speaking to other organizations people ask us about what software is work so it's really important to know that you know more and more people with disabilities are now in the workplace and so if, if there's things that aren't working for them then it's an obligation for the organization to find something that does work so if you are in that list of organizations that are accessible then it's great um, for you um, in terms of marketing, accessible websites can reach a wider audience. Literally, you're opening up your message, your product, your service to more people. Um, search engines love accessible websites. They have more opportunities to um, tag your website. So, um, for example, if you've got a video on your website, there's only so much Google can do to categorize your video and to, to bring it up in search results. But if your video has, say, a transcript, then there's lots of keywords in that transcript for Google to um, capture your website by. So that's just one example. Um, it's an increased return on investment. So if you're paying a lot of money for, um, for creating your website or your app, then clearly you don't want it to um, close the doors to 15 to 20% of the population. Um, and also improves brand rec recognition. So if your product is doing something great and it's, um, and, it's, and it's very inclusive, then you know that news travels fast. Uh, just give you a brief, brief um, example, my sister, um, she's she's created herbal essence shampoo bottles in an inclusive way. So in the in America now, if you buy a herbal essence shampoo bottle, you can feel um, from tactile markings that it's shampoo. And then on on the conditioner bottles, there's slightly different tactile markings that show that it's conditioner. And it was just a small change which helps people who are blind. But also, if you're in the shower and you can't, you know, you've not got your glasses with you. I don't know how many people go into the shower with their glasses, but if you don't have them with you, it's a great way. And just because of that one thing, um, Procter & Gamble, the company that makes Herbal Essence, they're getting so much publicity um, from that one little change. And obviously it's helping people who are disabled. Um, and also just on marketing, good news travels fast and bad news travels faster. Um, social media is becoming a very active space now for um, for people who are not able to access a service to um, vent their concerns, share their concerns. Uh, inclusive design, next slide, helps everybody. Um, so accessible products and services and apps and websites are not just for disabled people. Um, it's a well-known fact when you do make um, your product usable by people who are disabled, because it's, it's quite a challenging um, problem at times, you know, to make, how would you make your website accessible to someone who's blind, for example, or someone who has, uh, you know, cognitive impairment. Um, it forces you to, to, you know, make the language easier to understand and, and then uh, it makes you um, use best practices when it comes to the code. So there's many, many reasons that, that, that force you to make a better product that ultimately can be uh, used by everybody, providing equal opportunities, you're not excluding people. Um, once again, as I've mentioned, um, accessible digital provides a lot of independence to people who are disabled now. That was not possible in the past. 
Um, 83% of disabilities are acquired um, during working life. So, you know, people are prone to maybe get a disability or know someone with a disability. And also as we get older, we're prone to having impairments. So if we design a world now that's going to be helpful for us in the future, then that's a good thing. Um, legally, internationally, um, there are laws in, in many countries that are basically saying, you know, you don't want to discriminate against people um, who are disabled. You don't want to stop them from accessing your product. Um, so there's a timeline here on the slide that shows the various laws in various countries, but just, just UK, relevant to the UK, we've got, um, got the 2005 Ireland's Disability Act. Um, we've got the 2010 um, Equality um, Act, which covers many different protective characteristics, including uh, disability, and that replaces the um, Disability Discrimination Act we used to have, and 2016 European Disability Act, and um, more recently, the 2018 Public Sector Bodies Website and Mobile um, Accessibility, um, Mobile Apps Accessibility Regulation, which basically says that um, public sector websites and um, charities that are involved with helping people who are disabled and need to have accessible websites and apps and also um, as part of that work with um, providers who are accessible. And so if, if you have business in the public sector then it's definitely something to be um, aware of and all and these guidelines are based on um, something called WCAG and we're just going to come to that in a second and generally not applying, not, not um, complying to um, these laws and regulations obviously um, can um, affect your reputation and more and more there's um, there's, there's more uh, legal cases which are taking place. A lot of them are settled outside court but um, there's more public ones happening now and this, this trend will just increase. Um, so what is the W3C? Um, just checking, is that the slide we're on now, guys? Just to make sure I'm on the same slide, Catherine? Yes, yes. that's right, Eddie. Good, okay. <laughs> so the W3C, um, you, you might all be aware of it, um, is the World Wide Web Consortium, and it's an international group that determines the protocols and best practices for the internet. They create specifications for HTML, CSS, um, they're like a technical standards body and a primary initiative of the W3C is a web, um, website accessibility initiative and that has um, um, the web content accessibility guidelines. So there's certain guidelines that you follow to help you create accessible content for your website and for your apps. Um, so the four main principles um, within um, WCAG and under underneath those four principles is 61 success um, criteria um, and these guidelines and, and test criteria this is what um, a lot of the workability net does when we look at someone's website or we look at someone's app we're testing it against these types of success criteria. So we've got the four sort of main categories, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And just simply, simply stated, perceivable just means are people able to perceive your content in whatever way, they pre whatever way is appropriate for them to perceive it. So for example, is the color contrast okay? Um, understandable, um, does it make sense, the content to the person when they're reading it? Are they able to operate uh, and interact with the content. So are you able to click the buttons and enter information into the fields, um, regardless of whatever type of technology you might be using because, um, because of your disability? And robust, are you able to access and enjoy and interact with that content on different types of platforms? And this is really important. This makes the point once again, that when you make an inclusive product that helps everyone um, because not everyone now uses just a laptop to access the internet. It's a mobile first world. So we're using things like our mobile phones a lot when we're out and about to um, do a lot of tasks. So um, if, for example, you know, the color contrast is good on your phone, it will help someone who's visually impaired, for example, but it will also help everyone else when you're in the phone, and you've got the glaring sun on the phone. So the contrast um, will help there, will, will help everyone in that case. Um, 
since June 2018, um, um, WCAG 2.1 has been up, um, updated. So it's got some additional um, criteria. So everything in 2.0 still um, is there, but they've just added a few more um, success um, criteria. And it just takes into account more the fact that we use mobile technology a lot. Um, and it takes into a, um, account a little bit more on the cognitive impairment side and low vision. Um, okay, so some top top tips here. Um, this is no, uh, no way an exhaustive list. Um, so it's just important to build accessibility into your organization, uh, into the processes and the culture of your organization, because it's very easy to build something, have it checked for accessibility, um, fix it, make it accessible, uh, and then for it all to just break at your next release. So just make sure you've got the processes so you're by default making accessible products. Um, use diverse personas, so to make sure you understand the world is made up of different types of people, so make sure um, you're aware of the different types of use cases and you're designing for them. That will help to ensure that you're hitting the spot. Um, make sure to write in plain English. Um, it's very clear that people don't have a lot of time. They want to quickly get through your website. So if you write in plain English, it helps everyone, but especially people with maybe some learning dif differences or you know, people who, who don't have English as a first language, for example. Um, so just make sure your layout is quite simple. It helps people to read better. Uh, ensure good color contrast for some of the reasons I mentioned before. Um, ensure that um, the information is responsive on a website. And this obviously helps when people are viewing your content on different platforms that it can be resized um, to, to what is appropriate to them. So don't fix anything. Um, and also, uh, if you are using images uh, to convey any type of information, which, which is important to have images, people learn in different ways, but just make sure that there is a description for that image. So when someone blind who is using a screen reader comes across the image, then there's a description uh, for that image. And, uh, and also that's helpful if people have the images turned off. And, and once again, the search engines have a little bit more text to get excited over. Um, point eight here, provide um, subtitles uh, and, and transcripts for, for videos. Uh, this obviously is very uh, essential for, for people who cannot hear what's happening in, in the video, but also if you know, people are um, watching a video in the office or on the train and they don't want to um, listen to it, they just want to see the captions, that's vital. Transcripts are just a great time saver for anyone to go through um, the content of a video, but they're essential for someone, say, who is um, deafblind. So the deafblind person may not be able to visually see the captions, so they would, they would read the captions um, using, for example, a braille display, electronic braille display. So the, the text from the transcript will come up on, on the braille display and then they, they would be able to read that. Um, audio descriptions for video. So make sure when you have video content that um, if it's very visual, so if you were to close your eyes and not be able to benefit from that video, if it's a lot of visual stuff going on, then either um, in the future, make videos that you could appreciate if you can see, or if you were in the other room and you could just hear it. Um, that's that's one way of doing it. And the second method is if, if visuals are, 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 are the only way to convey that information, then have an, a, an additional audio track that um, provides people information. So for example, when I go to the cinema, um, I sit there with an infrared headset and I watch, the, I watch the movie just like anyone else. And if there's visual stuff happening, that's not conveyed in the in the dialogue. Then there's this additional voice, pre-recorded audio track that that fills in the um, gaps. Um, the final point here: um, uh, use uh, semantic uh, markup. So that's just really saying use correct coding, for example, uh, on on your digital content. So for example, if you've got a web page and it's got like you know five sections, so you've got five headings just making those headings look bold and making them big and putting exclamation marks after them won't tell a screen reader user that's a heading. So you have to mark it up in the, in the code of the page, you know, give it an H1, H2, a heading level three, and depending on, on, on which part of the content that's 
in. Um, so hope that um, all was um, useful to you. If you have any questions, do, do mention them in the questions box. Um, and now I'm just going to hand over to uh, the lovely Catherine. Thank you very much, Addy. Um, it's really great to understand more about sort of what good accessibility online looks like and mm. just to get some examples of some of your experiences as well. So I'm sure that's really going to help bring this to life for everybody. Um, so it's lovely to understand the how and the why. Um, I'm going into the, the sort of the what area. So what do you do with this? So what is important for you and your customers when you're talking about accessibility online? Um, well, the key thing here is to provide your customers with information. So your accessibility help page is a fantastic tool to allow you to communicate your site and make your services more usable for your diverse customer base. This is really going to help to encourage them to choose your business over your competitors as well. So it's a great piece of PR. One thing that's important to note about an accessibility help page online um, is that just by having this page doesn't mean that your site is compliant or accessible. Um, what it means is you have a commitment to delivering a better customer experience for all of your customers. Uh, it allows you to set their expectations uh, and provide guidance and other options and ways of engaging with your business. So these are some of the key areas um, in which an accessibility help page can really help your customers. Talking about helping your customers, um, this is your chance, oh sorry, previous slide, <laughs> this is your chance to really help your customers as much as you possibly can. I'm going to give you an example here. So imagine a recently retired couple and they are planning their first luxury cruise. Um, they won't necessarily consider themselves as disabled, but when thinking about a cruise, they've got lots of different questions about the facilities and adaptations, things that are going to help make their cruise far more enjoyable. Uh, and like lots of older people, they're very comfortable using a tablet, which is what they tend to browse websites on most often. But they have problems with reading small text, things like color contrast, scrolling images, or those kind of small fiddly form fields. So one solution you can provide via your accessibility help page is actually to give advice to this retired couple um, and link to information that, that helps them ha know how they can increase their text sizes on their tablet thus making your FAQs on your website far easier to read, um, making their online experience a lot better and making them far more likely to book the cruise through your website rather than one of your competitors. So providing your customers with this advice really shows your commitment uh, to customer service and to the online experience, which is a great thing to do. And of course, it makes sense to make sure your site is as accessible as possible. So for example, as Eddie's mentioned, making sure the relative text sizing is used, nothing is fixed so that when this customer does increase the text size on the tablet, it will also increase on your website. Um, you know, there is a legal requirement here to say that your website should comply with the WCAG 2.0 guidelines. But in a real life competitive market, um, your site or app just needs to be designed with the needs of your customers in mind. And that includes a huge diverse range of needs. So advising your customers on how to make the most of their device is one thing, but telling your customers exactly what is and isn't accessible uh, will enable them to know upfront the best route that they can take to achieve their goals and the best ways in which they can communicate with you. This is going to save them time, effort, energy. Um, if they're trying an inaccessible journey on your website that you know is inaccessible, um, it's going to become very frustrating for that customer. So if they can kind of avoid that to begin with and just come straight down the route that works for them, um, you're really going to be engaging with that customer on a level that's going to, going to help them um, feel great about your brand and your business. So just as a couple on the cruise will remember the help they get from the lovely attentive staff who are there waiting to hand them a cocktail when they jump on board the cruise ship, um, their first experience of the website is equally as important. Um, they're going to feel like their needs have been catered for, they're going to be made to feel welcome, and it's going to create a lasting positive impact as well. So that's really what an accessibility help page online does. Um, just out of interest, I would like to run a second poll now um, just to find out if you know what accessibility issues currently um, appear on your site, if any, so I think my lovely colleague Mark has popped up this poll right now. So yeah, do you know what accessibility issues your company's website currently has, if any? So if yes, please share details in the chat window. Um, no, or I'm not sure. That's great. Um, so I think we've got some responses coming in. Yeah, I'll just add that you, you made me want to go on a cruise, Catherine. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that great um, kind of analogy for that kind of whole thing. And I think, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, 
I've actually got some questions that I might ask you and Addy later because I think hearing the personal side of this is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but not to go off track at this stage, um, you've, you've had 76% of people vote, or now up to 80% of people have voted. Um, so I'm going to end that poll and just share the results. Um, so interestingly, again, so 46% of you have said you're not sure. Um, so at this stage, you know, we, we've been talking about personas and um, giving some examples of real um, people who might be visiting your website. 46% um, of you are not sure um, about the accessibility issues that might exist on your website. Um, however, 36% uh, of you are, um, and the, the nice figure here is 18% uh, of you um, don't know of any accessibility issues on your website. Um, we might we might be able to challenge you on that. I don't know, but um, um, yeah. So there's some interesting stats there, and I think this will hopefully frame some of the stuff that you're going to go on to now, Catherine. That's great. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Appreciate the feedback on that poll there. It's really interesting um, that some of you um, seem to be quite aware, which is great. You know, 30% of you are aware of what issues there exist. That some of you feel like there are no issues on your site great as well you must be really on top of your accessibility testing for there to be no issues whatsoever um, but for those of you who don't know what I will say is that knowing where your site is now in terms of meeting accessibility standards um, it's only one stepping stone on the journey towards a really excellent online accessibility help page but it's an incredibly important one um, that's something that we can actually help support with as well. So AbilityNet, as Mark has mentioned previously, we are accessibility experts uh, and we can help you with a huge range of different services to pinpoint issues, provide recommendations with how to fix them, train your teams to prevent issues from ever occurring in the first place, um, as well as diverse user testing that can help you not only make sure your website is accessible, but actually really user friendly for people with diverse needs too. So that's just something to bear in mind and to get in touch with us if you feel like we can be of any help to you at all with that. Moving in to talk about an accessibility framework because it, it's not all about the testing, it's not all about the auditing and knowing, okay, here's my backlog of issues. To create a truly inclusive website, as Addy has previously touched on, you really need to consider accessibility throughout all of your project lifecycle. So incorporating it into all the different phases of your project and really making it business as usual. So I'm just going to run you through an example of, um, you know, how to consider accessibility at the different sorts of types of phases you're going to have. So planning phase, um, to say, for example, you've got an online uh, registration feature for your website and there is a new um, registration which requires a customer to be able to hold up their phone to do a selfie video. So if that's the case, great. But, you know, as a discussion point for during this planning phase, what about people who have a motion impairment? Maybe they can't hold their mobile phone up to be able to take that selfie video or somebody who's using a screen reader, for example. So these are questions to raise at that phase to, to put to the experts, to put to your different design teams in order to really create a optimized experience for all your different types of customers. So we get through the planning phase, we're in design. Okay, great, your design team have come up with a whole new color palette, um, new brand and everything, which is lovely. But has anyone checked the color contrast? As as you Addy mentioned, color contrast can really help lots of different users, um, different situations being outside as well, where, where you can't really see your screen that well, but also lots of different low vision users too. Um, color blindness is incredibly common, far more common than people think it is. I believe the statistic is that one in four men in the UK have color blindness. Um, so that's definitely something to consider at design phase. Development phase, so your screens are being built, great. But the design patterns that your developers are working from, do they have accessibility features as part of that process? Are your coders actually developing with accessibility in mind? Because if they are, there are going to be less issues to fix at the next phase, which is, as we all know, testing. So testing, testing, testing is uh, everything that we all have to do as part of our uh, project phases when it comes to online. Um, and there are some really easy key things that you can do to make sure that your site um, is being tested for accessibility as you go. So the best thing I can recommend you do is you take hold of your mouse, throw it out, and just test your website with a, key with a keyboard. Tab through um, all of the interactive elements, making sure they're in focus, making sure you can, you can access the links, you can access the drop-down fields with the space bar, with the enter key. Um, you can download a free screen reader, NVDA is a free offering out there, um, and you can use that slightly more complicated in order to test for the screen reader. You might need a little bit of training in order to do that, but that's definitely something that we can help with as well. Um, and don't forget to test with real life users. User testing is a wonderful way of generating real life feedback. So we've done all our testing, made all our fixes, and now it's time to deploy, which is great. But before we get 
too carried away communicating to our customers all the wonderful things we've been doing, you've really got to ensure the infrastructure is in place behind the scenes um, so that these processes will work. So what I mean by this is, okay, make sure your feedback channels are in place for your customers. So a customer query comes in, it gets diverted to the right team first time, you have a method and a way of incorporating customer recommendations into your backlogs um, and your standard releases. And you also have the ability to feedback to customers on the outcome of their comments and their feedback to you as well. So it's all that behind the scenes stuff that needs to happen as part of incorporating accessibility into your processes. And in fact, Addy had quite a, um, a good example of this experience lately with Airbnb. So he went through their online channels to provide some feedback on some of the gestures that weren't working with their app on his iOS device. Um, he said it was really easy to find out how to get in touch and how to provide feedback, which was great, um, but got really generic response in return, which kind of pushed the issue back onto him saying, this is a problem with your phone, with your operating system, with Apple, you should really get in touch with them. Now, Addy knows when it's an iOS related issue and when it's an issue that's affecting um, the accessibility, which is coming from an app or a website. In this instance, they hadn't coded the app correctly in order to be able to use all the different gestures, somebody um, using VoiceOver, which is the Apple screen reader. Um, it took him a little while, but eventually his query did get to the right team to, to pick up as an accessibility issue. But I think the whole experience left him feeling a bit lost and undervalued as a customer. Um, and, and, and quite a lot of effort really, considering he was giving them free feedback and free advice. Um, he's heard back that the team have, have picked it up, but no further feedback on that, on, on whether they've actually um, incorporated his feedback into anything that they're working on. So just really considering that whole journey and how to make your customers feel valued and, and appreciated for, um, for actually communicating and, and helping you. So great work. We now have an accessibility framework and you've gone through all the first steps um, to making sure that your website is accessible, um, which is wonderful. And you've got your back end infrastructure in place as well. What you need to do is make sure that it is regularly maintained. As Addy has mentioned, future releases and things can change absolutely everything. So making sure that accessibility is part of your test scripts, making sure that your developers are trained and understand what area is and making sure that that is part of your business as usual. So once everything's in hand, now is the time to communicate to your customers what you're doing. So provide regular updates, um, shout about all the good work you're doing, tell them what's changed, tell them where there's issues uh, and let them know what's coming up as well. They're going to be really interested to see um, what future developments you're planning for your website or app. Um, and don't forget to ask for their input. So promote the fact that you want their feedback. Make it really easy for them to get in touch with you. Uh, you have such a hugely diverse range of user testers at your disposal. Not only that, these are people that are already interested in your products and services. So they are your target market um, and they, they're really, really key resource to tap into um, if you can manage to do so. So as part of your accessibility help page, lots of websites will have an accessibility statement. So this really helps to state whether or not you comply with WCAG 2.0, which is the sort of internationally um, minimum accepted standard for website accessibility. So the statement can be seen as sort of fulfilling a legal obligation, but it is not a legal requirement to have one unless you are public sector in the UK, which is all part of the new public sector regulations. So even though your site is fully accessible, so for those percents of you out there who said, no, you've got no issues on your accessibility um, on your website, a statement can still be really useful because this is a great PR tool. You can promote to your customers and reassure them that all the common features on your website are fully accessible, are going to work for them with their assistive technologies, um, which is a fantastic way to promote your products and services. So the statement will help you kind of get into the nitty gritty of what your um, site's accessibility is like, but also your actual framework and your commitment to inclusiveness because you're telling your customers what you're doing to test for accessibility, um, how you're doing it, what the outcome of that is uh, and what that means um, and, and what else they can do. So what the alternative routes are for those customers. If you do have an inaccessible journey, that's, that's okay. You know, you can put your hands up and say, hey, we know this, this route isn't working very well with the screen reader right now, but you know what, you can phone this number, you can send an email to this address uh, and we will manage it that way. So it's a really good way of kind of breaking down the detail and getting into that level of information um, for your customers. Um, and in the next few slides, I will be sharing some business cases with you just to give you a little bit more of an insight into what that might look like. 
However, my lovely colleague Natalie um, is running an in-depth webinar. I think it's next week. Mark's going to give you some details about it at the end of this webinar. And it is a far more in-depth look at an accessibility statement, um, how to create an accessibility statement, what should go into it, how it should be maintained, uh, and all of the kind of um, maintenance around that. So it would be a really interesting webinar to join if anybody out there is looking to create an accessibility statement in the near distant future. So my first business case, just to have a look at, is Kent Council. So I've got some snippets of their accessibility page online um, just to draw your attention to. So they have a really nice, clear breakdown on their website accessibility page. Um, it, it breaks it down by all the different ways that they actually work to make their site accessible. So you get the nitty gritty of the navigation, what they do to help you navigate by headings, by links, by keyboard. It gives you all the different um, formats that you can listen to their audio or their video in as well. Not only do they give you that level of breakdown, they also provide their customers with the tools to optimize their devices to suit their abilities. So these alternative formats um, that they're providing here and the, the, the other supporting information are links through to my computer my way. And that just really helps their individual customers to optimize their devices so that they're using um, their device to the best of its ability to help them. Um, they also give quite a good overview on where their web standards are at, at the moment what level of testing they do, what the known issues are, um, and a really clear way of getting in touch, what happens next, how to contact them, how to give them good feedback, and how to make a complaint. So they've given us a really, really good example of, of what an accessibility statement looks like there. You've heard us mention quite a few times My Computer My Way. So just to give you a bit more information about what My Computer My Way is, um, it's a free tool. Uh, it was actually developed by AbilityNet uh, with support from Microsoft and the BBC. And it's a source of accessibility help for all different computer users. So desktop computers, laptops, tablets, smartphones, you name it, there is advice on my computer my way in order to help you optimize all the different settings and features within these devices um, for everybody's individual access needs. Um, and this is not just for people with disabilities. Uh, you know, myself, I'm mildly short-sighted. I wear my glasses, but not all the time because I often forget them. Uh, so I have all of my devices set to be the biggest text possible because it's less eye strain. And you know, that less eye strain means healthier eyes for me, meaning hopefully my vision won't be getting worse in the future. So I definitely recommend you all to have a look at my computer my way and see different ways that you can optimize your devices for your needs as well. But thinking about your customers, um, my computer my way is a fantastic tool for them because you need to think about what they need. So in the instance of our retired couple going off on the cruise, they needed to increase their tech size. Those FAQs were just so tiny, they couldn't see them properly. So having a link on your accessibility help page to information on how to increase tech size on different devices could be really, really useful for these different types of customers. You have the data. Um, or your web teams or somebody within that area in your company will have that data, who your customers are, what browsers they're using, what devices they're using, what's the split between desktop and mobile. You can use that information, you can use that data to provide your customers with relevant information, relevant links, relevant advice, helping them for their devices and really enabling them to have a much better experience on your website. And the fact that you're supporting them to do that um, is really going to, to help encourage them to stick with your business for the, all of your products and services. So as I said, it's a free tool, um, but there is um, another offering that we have, which is, which is enabling you to embed My Computer My Way within your site. So a lot of our, our customers and clients do not wish for their customers to leave their website to come to My Computer My Way in order to check through the, the information on there. They want to keep them within their website um, using their tools and their services, which is absolutely great. So what we can do is create um, in collaboration and embedded version of My Computer My Way that is optimized for your customer base within your domain. So please do get in touch if that's something that you think you'd be interested in for your customer base. Um, we can definitely give you a lot more information about that. And just to give you uh, an example of this, so Barclays, who are one of our um, major clients I work with on a, on a weekly basis, in fact, uh, we have worked really closely with them to generate uh, an embedded My Computer My Way on their website. So it's part of their kind of help toolkit for their customers. And we have collaborated, combined our knowledge and created this incredible in-house help center um, to really help Barclays customers' needs through all their different devices. So that's got quite a good example on there. Um, or, of accessibility help um, and going that one step further in really helping your customers. 
So to summarize, I would like to give you some top tips on your accessibility help page. So here are the five major things that you should, you should include um, in order to help your customers. So number one is to provide a really clear breakdown of everything you do to make your site accessible. So all the hard work that all of your teams do in the back end, tell your customers what you do. They would love to hear that. Number two, promote accessibility awards and successes. So shout about the good stuff. Have you achieved an accessibility accreditation? Great, have you got some sort of really good recognition on social media? Great, share that information, share the testimonials as well. Uh, number three is to really be honest. Honesty and transparency with your customers, um, they will really appreciate that, telling them where there are issues and providing them with the alternative routes, um, as well as regular updates on the status of the issues. So that's definitely something that they would appreciate uh, from your brand. Number four is to encourage customers to engage with you about the needs regarding your website. So tapping into that free um, user testing database that you've got at your disposal. Uh, and number five is to provide free resources to support your customers with their digital access needs. We are all on a scale of ability and we can all do things within our own devices that are gonna help really make our online experiences that much better. So I'd like to thank you all very much for listening and for joining in the webinar. I'm going to hand back over to Mark, who's got a, a few other bits to go through with you. Um, but I hope you found that really useful. Um, I hope you, you, you're going to come along and join our um, Accessibility Statements webinar next week as well. Uh, and please do put your questions in the uh, Q&A chat panel for us to answer at the end of this webinar. So Mark, yeah. I'll hand back to you. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. And thanks, Adi. Um, I'll, 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 yeah, we've got a few other things that we're going to go through. Um, I think Really interesting to hear you talk about um, My Computer My Way. Um, I think that's really important that like people um, can go away and have a look at that um, and even perhaps find the, the Barclays example if they want to. Um, it's really interesting to actually kind of go through a journey um, if you perhaps put yourself in a position of the older couple that um, Catherine's been referring to, thinking about how you would use that tool because um, it has options for, you know, um, whether you want to look at something related to vision or hearing. Um, so it's a really practical tool to go through. Um, we've also included some um, useful links here. So up on the, on the screen at the moment is the gov.uk, um, which has various accessibility pages and advice. Um, the JISC mail email list. I know that um, there's a lot of people on this webinar that will be interested in the webinar next week, um, which is about the new uh, web accessibility regulations for the public sector. Um, so that's a lot of you are probably already aware of that. Um, government digital services, um, they, they've got advice pages. Um, and there's also the IAP membership and CPAC. So IAP, Catherine will correct me if I'm wrong, um, I'm not, no, Catherine, IAP stands for, <laughs> it's the, it's on the screen, Mark, it's the International, <laughs> International Association of Accessibility Professionals. I'm so focused on the left side of the screen that I'm not looking <laughs> on the right side of the screen. Um, I just so, got my CPAC certificate this week, actually, in the mail yesterday. <laughs> well done. Um, so yeah, so those that aren't in the know, like myself, um, although I should be, um, IAP stands for the International Association of Accessibility Professionals um, and CPAC is a, a, a qualification. Um, it has different levels that you can achieve, um, but it's a, it's a great way of, of learning. And again, you know, when I feel that when Catherine was talking earlier about shouting about your successes, um, to be able to say that you've got staff that have this qualification, I feel like that's one of the things that you would shout about, isn't it, Catherine? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's something that we do shout about, in fact. Yeah. So the AbilityNet consultants um, will all have different levels within this, um, depending on sort of the level of consultancy they've achieved at that point. So CPAC certified, WAS certified, um, for example, and we get heavily involved as well in the moderation um, and we work really closely with the IAAP um, as a charity. They are a fantastic organisation out there who offer lots of different training and advice. And again, they have webinars and lots of different things to help with too, but you definitely want to shout about the qualifications that you team have in the world of accessibility there aren't many of them out there so uh, so this is a good one to go for brilliant thanks um, and we'll move along then so we have got kind of a, a final I guess closing poll that we just just want to run so we kind of um, briefly touched on my computer my way um, but I think one thing that we just wanted to do was just get a sense of so do you feel your website users would benefit from my computer my way as explained on the webinar today you know, we, we talked about the fact that actually for an individual to go in and say, I have a, you know, even myself, um, Addy, you made a comment earlier about take wearing glasses in the, in the shower. Catherine and myself are both wearing glasses at the moment. Um, so, you know, 
would that be a great tool for your website users? Um, yes, no. Obviously, do encourage you to, uh, to go away and have a look at the tool um, yourselves after the webinar because I appreciate, um, you know, it's not really until you're up close looking at something that you, you get a sense for um, what the benefit might be. We've had 66% uh, of you vote, so I am just going to end the poll and really pleased to see that 98% of you have um, said yes to that. So yes, you do think it's something that um, your website users would uh, uh, benefit from. So that's really great. Um, and I'm looking at the time, so I'm going to thank Addy and Catherine again, and I'm going to move on to the Q&A section of this um, webinar, just to see if we can fit in a few questions. Some have already come through, um, so if you, uh, if you have anything you want to ask, please do use the Q&A window. Um, I have been keeping an eye on the chat window, but it's not, as, um, it's, it's not very easy for us to follow up with you after the webinar. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Catherine a, a couple of questions, I think. Shoot. So Alice has asked, um, her organisation um, doesn't have uh, many staff or, or people they can kind of go to that have disabilities. Mm -hmm. So what can AbilityNet recommend? Um, can, can we recommend any way of finding real life test you, testers? I know you mentioned about, um, you know, as much as possible, you want to use your own website users. Mm -hmm. Um, but what, what would you say are, is an alternative to that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if you're not um, got the data behind you to know who your users are and potentially which ones are assisted technology users and things like that, then there are a whole range of experts at your disposal. Um, as I mentioned at AbilityNet, we do diverse user testing and we have a ginormous database of diverse user testers. And by that, I mean, we're not just looking at people that necessarily classify themselves as disabled. So yes, we have people who are blind and use a screen reader or people who are deaf uh, and require um, sign language or captions. But we're also looking at people who are like a retired couple, the silver surfer community, who just have a few different kind of access needs. So we have a huge database of user testers um, at our disposal. And if you'd like to arrange some user testing, then we can do that. And with yourselves, uh, we have labs in our London offices as well. So we can actually arrange the whole thing for you um, or we can just employ user testers um, for your own use as well so definitely get in touch with us if user testing is something you're interested in um, it's something I promote absolutely everywhere it gives you the best feedback um, around the user experience and, and it actually just helps to bring everything to life so if you're working with a team that's not very engaged with accessibility um, or they're kind of asking you why do I need to do this you sit them down in front of uh, some lab testing and actually watch different users try and use that website or app um, that that developers created and and see where they struggle it can really bring everything to life so I definitely recommend that's something you look to invest in great thank you um, there's been a few questions about the webinar we've been referring to, so I have got details on the follow-up screen, but um, so they are going to follow um, after the Q&A section, um, but just to mention, I have shared it in the chat window, so that webinar that follows next Thursday, just to mention, is an, an update on the new UK public sec uh, sector web accessibility regulations. So we had a, uh, a webinar back in May, um, where, which was kind of our initial webinar, kind of looking at kind of some top line, um, uh, top line um, important information from the new regulations. Um, and then this is an update on that. So there have been some changes, there's some new requirements, um, there's some new information that's available. So that's now in the chat window, just in case you are in the public sector and want to, um, and want to register for that next Thursday. I thought I'd mentioned that. What I will uh, add to that, Mark, as well, is um, even if you're not in the public sector, I would still strongly recommend um, coming along and, and, and checking that out because you know the government sort of sets the standard and paints the way uh, and as, as when you look at sort of the timeline slide um, when different laws and regulations do tend to come in you know the government will kind of do their own initiatives first and that would definitely gradually trickle down to the rest and private sectors so just because it's not a legal requirement at the moment that websites are WCAG 2.1 compliance to AA level um, doesn't mean they won't be so it's definitely worthwhile coming on to check out in particular if you work with public sector at all because this will carry forward to their preferred suppliers yeah and i suppose it's worth it's worth highlighting that i know at the beginning of the um webinar we we asked people and there were a lot of accessibility advocates out there as well so yeah as you say there's even if you're not in the um, um public sector it might just be something that you you are interested in just so you can be um kind of well-rounded and aware of um what's going on um in that space 
I have a, a question for you, but um, I think something that's just important to say is we will probably do a follow-up um, blog post um, following this webinar um, um, where I'll connect with um, Catherine and Addy just on any points that we don't get around to responding to. So I'm going to ask the question, but if it's, if it's too broad a question to answer, Catherine, just push back on me. I um, <laughs> will do. Um, but somebody has asked, has asked, are there any specific fonts recommendations for accessibility? I know that's such a broad question, but I'm wondering if you have like your free tips that you might start somebody off with and say, this is where you need to start. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I would always just start with everything relatively basic. So, you know, the, your aerial style fonts, things that aren't um, italicized, things have got good spacing that are easy to see, um, nothing below 12 points. Um, we all like larger text sizes. If you look around your offices today, I'm sure you'll see people squinting at their screens. And if they just simply increase the text sizing, it would make their lives a lot easier. So, um, yeah, making sure you've got a good size, making sure it's a really clean and easy to read basic font font um, that browsers can use as well but we can absolutely provide some more um, tips for you on the blog post Mark's mentioned about that. Great thank you. Um, again another one but again push back on me if it's not appropriate to answer on this um, but Adam has just asked um, do you have any guidance for people using eye gaze technology to access websites? Um, so I'm assuming what, what Adam's asking there is um, with, with those kind of requirements is, is there anything particular that shouts out in terms of considerations for your website in terms um, of using eye tracking software yeah. um do you know that's not something that i know a huge amount about but i will refer to my colleague who's a bit more of an expert in that field and get some details for you in the blog post that mark's mentioned so keep an eye out for that one thank you um there was a few things that came through on the chat so i wanted to share this just because i think it's a, it's a really really nice thing that i think um catherine and addy will appreciate i'm, I'm just trying to find the comment uh so there's a lady called Christina. I hope she's still on the webinar, but maybe um, maybe she's left because I, we, we are coming up to that kind of hour hour um, that we we kind of promised on. Um, but she just wanted to say she's new to webinars. She's only done one previously. She doesn't necessarily fit any of the categories in our in our first poll that we had. Um, and she's just an individual in a living room on her laptop. Um, she does the website for a very small local church, and she uses a free template provided by BT. Um, I'm, she's trying to learn all she can and that's why she's here and she is disabled herself. I just thought I'd share that with you both because I thought that was just, um, it just shows you the diversity of people that are on this webinar and how even somebody that potentially has a very small estate in terms of their website is still interested in making it as accessible as possible. Um, oh, that's great. Well, we wish you all the best with your, uh, with your church website and yeah. please do check out My Computer My Way and the AbilityNet website. We have lots of free resources that can help you. Yeah. Great. Um, there are more questions, but I am aware of the time. So I'm just going to ask Catherine just to move on to the, uh, on to the next slide, because we have got two last slides just to go through. Um, and I would, again, just reiterate, um, we'll make sure that any questions we didn't get around to answering, um, we do respond to either, um, you know, one-to-one -one, um, or will be included in a follow-up blog kind of answering those questions. Um, but yeah, so just to round off the, e uh, the webinar, just to highlight how we can help. And um, we've already talked about it a lot, but if you think you'd benefit from our expert advice, we offer a range of um, accessibility services um, tailored to suit your objectives and requirements. Uh, there's a link here to speak to our experts so you can contact us and um, talk about your specific requirements. Um, that's abilitynet.org.uk forward slash speak dash to dash our dash experts. Um, there's also updates and news on our website. Um, so on our website, on the, on the top menu, there's a news and blogs page. Um, so you can go to that. I know that somebody asked about our um, previous webinars. Um, so there's, uh, there's also a free resources section, um, which lists all our recent webinars. So you can go to that. You can sign up for the upcoming webinar, but you can also watch the webinar that I referred to that happened back in May. Um, please do join our mailing list. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a key mechanism for us to update you on future webinars um, and make sure you're, you're, you're kept up to date with the latest accessibility news. And then just on the next slide, uh, we've already talked about these, but we do have upcoming events. Um, so there is the webinar next Thursday on the web accessibility regulations for UK HE and public sector. And that is an update webinar following our previous webinar in May. Um, and we also have our HE Web Accessibility Training Program, which is this summer. Um, it does start in a couple of weeks, our first workshop. It's a series of four workshops. 
Um, it's specific to the education space. Um, so if you work in a college or a university, it's designed to help you um, achieve kind of the requirements with the 23rd of September deadline in mind, which is part of the new uh, public sector regulations. And then please do watch this space because um, news about TechShare Pro um, is coming up. The UK's biggest accessibility inclusive design event organized by AbilityNet. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's an annual event now. It's, this year it's going to be over two days, hosted by Google in London. Um, so yes, watch this space, more information about that. Um, the UK's biggest accessibility and inclusive design event organized by AbilityNet. Um, I just want to take the time to really thank Catherine and Addy. I really appreciate them, um, Addy giving a bit of a personal perspective. Um, I really like Catherine, how she presented kind of like, gave some real personas and gave real world examples of how, um, how this impacts people um, and some very, very practical tips that I hope people will take away. So I want to thank them both very, very much. Um, and also um, everyone, all our attendees that joined um, and I'm sure learned a lot today. There'll be a post webinar survey, so please do give any feedback and any comments. Um, but other than that, I think all that's left to say is just we, we look forward to you joining us on the next webinar and, and we hope everyone has a great day. So great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Bye then. Bye.